Good morning, Cornerstone family. We're so glad to be worshiping with you this morning. I'm Valerie Carson, and this is my husband, Don. This is Barney and Susie. Right now, Don is going to read the scripture for us this morning. I'm going to read from John chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. It's going to be a wonderful day. So let's continue to worship together. Mountains are still being moved. Strongholds are still being loose. God, we believe. Yes, we can see. The wonders are still what you do. We are here for you. Come into what you do. We are here. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. 
we live for you I feel Jesus the name above every other name Jesus the only one who can ever say Worthy of every breath we can ever breathe for you. Jesus, we put our trust in you this morning. We build our lives around you. Because when all else fails, when all else crumbles, you're still there, strong as you were before and will always be. We can put our hope in you. We can put our trust in you. Whatever the times hold for us, whatever season we may be in. We can always have faith in you, in your name, above all other names. So this morning we do that as we dive into your word. We say we trust you. We put our faith in you. So now we pray. Amen.
right. Amen. Thank you, Dustin and the worship team. I appreciate that so much. Hey, it is so good to have all of you joining us online today. If you are a guest, if you're somebody who is not a regular part of Cornerstone, let me just begin by saying thank you for giving up your time uh, to join us, to participate with us today. Uh, We appreciate you so much. And please let us know if there's a way that we can help you or serve you. We would be glad to do that. Sure hope all of you are doing good. Looks like some of you got a haircut. It looks great. I, I don't know that, actually. I don't know if you got a haircut or not. But anyway, if you did, I'm sure it looks amazing. This week, finally, some people were able to do some things. Maybe you got to go out to a restaurant and all of that. Uh, feels like things are sort of waking up a little bit, and so that's really good. Hey, a few things I want to talk about before I get into the message this morning. Number one is fill the bins, what we've been doing every Friday, collecting food here at the church for the food bank. And I want to give you a total from last Friday and this past Friday, because I didn't get to give you a total last Sunday. So here's a total of those two Fridays of food that we collected. We collected 3,669 pounds of food. That's a lot of food. That translates into 2,822 meals for people in this community who desperately need it during this time. Uh, Really, truly phenomenal. And um, it's just great to watch that happen. I know that uh, Martha Hank out at the food bank, she's the director. She's so happy to see that food come and fill their shelves. And you know, thankfully it doesn't stay on the shelves long these days. It goes straight to people who are in need. And uh, so it's just a, a perfect way uh, for you and I and for our community to be the hands and feet of Christ. So glad to see other churches engaged, like Auburn United Methodist Church. Uh, church of the Highlands West Campus promoted it this week. And it's nice to see churches in partnership in this community. And we love that. And we're so glad to be able to do that, to genuinely love our community. So uh, this afternoon, also, just a reminder, Kona Ice Celebration right here in the parking lot of our church. Anytime you want to come between 3 and 5 p.m., what you're going to do is just drive your car in the parking lot, and we're going to have our uh, seniors out in the, in the parking lot, and you can wave to them, honk to them. If, uh, if you have a poster or some balloons or something, you want to hold that up, that would be great. Just a great way to say to them, hey, we love you, and we're celebrating graduation, and uh, we just want them to know that. And then you can go pick up some Kona ice on us. It's going to be hot this afternoon, so it would be a great day uh, for you to come out and do that again between 3 and 5 this afternoon, and so I look forward to seeing us all, all of us here for that. Hey, just know that this morning at the end of my message, I'm going to do a special blessing for our graduating seniors. So if you are a graduating senior, please hang in there with me to the end, or parents of seniors. You know, I just want to be able to do that for them. So this morning, we're going to wrap up this message series that we have been in for the last several weeks, just called More Than Conquerors. And uh, we've been spending each week kind of reflecting off of what happened on Easter Sunday, You know, we talk about that when Jesus died on the cross, he conquered sin. And then when he rose from the the grave, he conquered death. You know, he conquered sin and death. And uh, as followers of Christ, we too then align ourselves with Christ. We are a part of conquering sin and death if we have Christ in our life. But what we've been talking about in addition to that is that Paul said we are more than conquerors. Uh, So that means in our daily life and everything that we do, we have this opportunity to conquer the struggles, the difficulties, the pain, you know, the sin in our life. And so we've been looking at what that means practically for us. Like, what does it mean to conquer those difficult thoughts in my mind? How do I get Christ to control my mind? And, or what about my mouth? <laughs> That's, that could be a very difficult thing to control. And, and uh, so we've just been looking at that. How do we control our attitude? And um, this morning what I want to do is I'm going to land this by just talking a little bit about what does it mean to be a more than a conqueror through those dry seasons in our life spiritually, through those seasons of drought, you know, those low places. Maybe some of you have had that even now and through this difficult season uh, that we've been in. So we're going to talk about kind of what that looks like. I was working on my sermon this week, and I was out on our back deck and and thinking through all of this, thinking about this drought. I'm looking over, and uh, in our backyard at the house, we've got this one pine tree. It's kind of a big pine tree, but it's just as dead as it can be. And uh, Thankfully, my good buddy John Upton, who's in our church, he and Julia, and they're just, by the way, just such generous people and loving, great to our church. But nonetheless, anyway, he helps me with my trees. So he came over several months ago, and he was looking at it. He said, hey, man, we need to do something about this tree. He said, not only is it dying, but you got beetles in it. And I think there's a picture up there that kind of shows the holes where the beetles have bored into it. And uh, so one of the things that uh, could have caused this 
is, you know, we've had a couple of droughts in the last decade, and particularly one back in 2016, and experts say that droughts can really uh, put a lot of stress on trees, and uh, it can cause trees to then be open to disease and to insects like beetles and other things. Uh, we've seen that down at Becky's family farm, lots of trees that died as a result of the drought. Many of them weren't in good soil either, and they were kind of in rocky places. Um, what's interesting is that a drought can, can hurt a tree, and then you won't know it for a long time. It won't show symptoms for a while. So it could have happened to our tree. We're not really sure about that. But John said, I said, do we need to cut it down right away? Like it's a big tree I'm kind of concerned about. It. He said, well... He said, not right now. He said, it looks dead on the outside, but it's got, you know, it's strong on the inside. It'll withstand, you know, the wind or whatever's going to come up. And I was like, oh, okay. I said, well, that's good. Good to hear. And I'm like, so it's dead, but it's not dead. You know, it's it's the living dead. It's a zombie tree. (laughs) Anyway, it's one of these trees that's got like, you know, it it looks bad on the outside, but it's okay because there was something on the inside that was going to help it for a while, you know. But anyway, it's dead, dead now, so we're going to have to take it down. But I'm thinking about that. I was just thinking about that tree in terms of just our lives or people's lives, how sometimes people go through these difficult seasons, you know, of drought. and, And on the outside, it just looks so difficult and like things are not going well. But, you know, in our life, when we go through those low times and maybe we're full of doubt or things are just not happening well, nothing's coming together, or, or right now for you, maybe it's finances or your job or something like that, you know, and it's like this feels not good, but God is reminding us. He's like, but I have put my spirit in you. I put my life in you, so I will carry you through the sea. There's still something in there to help you, and, and I'm just thinking that would be something important for us to talk about today, so we're going to do that this morning. I want to look at Ezekiel chapter 37. Uh, So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Also, um, the message notes uh, are available, and uh, so you'll want to pull those out. Uh, Jack will put a link to those message notes in there so you can follow along uh, as well. But the kind of the heading in my Bible for Ezekiel chapter 37 is Valley of Dry Bones. Now, I know you study Ezekiel like every week, so you're probably an expert on the book of Ezekiel. Lots of people are. Anyway, maybe you're not, but we're going to look at chapter 37 and just see, you know, what is happening here. So this is a vision that God gave the prophet Ezekiel. This is what this is all about. But I need to give you some background before we jump in uh, to this passage right here so that you'll have a better idea of what's going on. So Ezekiel was a prophet. He didn't start out that way. He started out actually being trained as a priest uh, to be a priest in Israel. Uh, But that didn't pan out because of the exile and all the things that were going on during the season. So at about age 30, Ezekiel starts having these visions Um, these dreams that God was bringing to him, and he started writing those down. And so the book of Ezekiel is a compilation of a lot of those visions that God was giving Ezekiel about the people of Israel, about what was going on uh, during that time. And so um, the book of Ezekiel, the, the timing of that, it was written after the defeat of the southern kingdom of Judah, all right, Uh, by the Babylonians. The northern kingdom had already been conquered 130 years before that by the Assyrians. So just, okay, so the the country of Israel was not exactly like it is today. It was split into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And so there was the northern kingdom that got defeated by the Assyrians, the southern kingdom that eventually got defeated by the Babylonians uh, that were taken into exile. It was a very difficult season, very difficult time. And really the way that we look at that, there was the judgment of God was upon Israel during this season. But why? Like, what was going on here? Why did they have to be conquered and go into exile? Well, there's a good reason. First of all, the northern kingdom, all the kings of the northern kingdom, the northern kingdom lasted about 210 years, but all the kings were wicked. Not a one of them served God and followed him in what they did. The southern kingdom really wasn't that different. There were nine out of 20 kings that actually served and loved and followed God and were obedient to him. But because of that, the people of Israel also too became wicked and just eventually looked like everything else around them in the pagan world. And, and so because of this, this just, you know, they were conquered and then they were taken into exile in a very difficult season for them. And, you know, exile lasted about 70 years. It was a long time, like almost a whole generation of people existed in exile and some of them died in exile, never saw uh, getting on the other side of that and finding their way back to Israel. So essentially, you can think about Israel like this. They were dead inside, you know, as a nation. They just, uh, this, this thing was happening to them that they didn't want, they didn't like. They were deprived of their land. They were deprived of their king. They were deprived of their temple. They were not near their place of worship and couldn't worship the way they used to. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> we're all kind of in that right now, you know, not being connected uh, to the church and the building. So that was happening there. Israel had also been divided 
and dispersed uh, so long that unification and uh, redemption for them almost seemed out of sight, almost seemed impossible. So you can just imagine this low place that they were in. So God then in this season begins to send prophets, like one prophet after another. And prophets kind of were, their mission was to, to speak truth to the people of Israel. Sometimes that truth was hard. It was like calling out their sin and warning them of God's wrath. And then other times it was words of hope and words of encouragement, like hang in there, God's got you, there's a better day coming. So this is what prophets did. So Ezekiel was a prophet who was sent to speak to Israel, but he spoke out of the visions that God had given him. All right, so let's get back to Ezekiel 37, this particular crazy vision that God gives Ezekiel. Uh, So here we go. Let's just pick it up at verse 1 of chapter 37. It says, The hand of the Lord was on me, and he, God, brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And he asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? So here's this vision, you know, um, that God has sort of taken Ezekiel in this dream, this vision, and taken him to this strange place, this valley, you know, with these bones. And, And this was going to become a very important vision for Israel, by the way. But it's this very strange scene, and I can only imagine that Ezekiel was confused about why he was there, what he was seeing, all of these bones for for just miles through this valley, laying on top of the ground, you know, dried out and all of this. And uh, I'm sure that he was wondering, why is this happening? By the way, we think that this was by the Chabar River, where quite possibly years before this, a, uh, a massacre had happened of, the, of an army. And so maybe it was that same situation. But So he's looking out, and, and, and at least it's a tragedy, right, that has happened here. Maybe a battle where everybody was, was slain. Um, a really difficult scene, I'm sure, for Ezekiel to look at. And, you know, trying to interpret that was probably hard for him, but it's kind of like these unburied skeletons as they lay on the ground. It was a reminder of the people of Israel were in this state of of living death, kind of like pining away until the end of their judgment, waiting to see what would happen. You know, they probably thought there was no hope, you know, that there might be no end to their exile, to their situation that they were in. It was a very difficult thing. And and, uh, so Ezekiel, too, he he was a man in trauma, you know, being a part of all of this, trying to speak to the people of his community. He probably had questions about himself to God. You know, God, can I survive this season? Can I survive this trauma? You know, can, I, can my community of people, can the Israelites survive this? Uh, I would imagine he had questions like that. And, and one thing that we know is that this was also a season of testing for him and, and for the Israelites. God was probably saying, are you going to be faithful to me? You know, do you think you can make it through all of this? Do you believe that guy was saying, do you believe I can get you through this season? Can these bones live? God was asking. And, uh, and so Ezekiel responds like this. He says, Sovereign Lord, you uh, alone know. In other words, it looks bad. <laughs> and and I, frankly, I don't have an answer right now because of how bad it looks. But I know that you have the answer, and therefore I will trust you. All right, so then we keep moving forward. Verse 4, and then God says to Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put my breath in you and you will come to life and then you will know that I am the Lord. And so here we begin to see some hope. You know, God is trying to tell Ezekiel, listen, there's a way through this, all right? And I'm going to put my breath in you. Now that word breath is the word ruach. And you have to say it with that C-H that ruach. It's either Klingon from Star Trek or it's Hebrew. Anyway, it's Hebrew. We're sure of that. But it's this word that means breath or breathed or it means breath of spirit or the spirit of God. And so basically what God is saying is, I am going to breathe my spirit into this lifeless situation. And I'm going to do a miracle here, uh, not just in this vision, but also in real life with the people of Israel. Have hope is what he is saying to Ezekiel, that we're going to get through this season of turmoil and despair and difficulty. Um, you know, and I think about this valley, you know, that 
Ezekiel's in, and that valley is so symbolic, not only of the Israelites' difficulty, but of our difficulty, right? Uh, have you ever been in the valley? Maybe you're in there right now. You know, lots of people are in the valley. They've lost their job. Uh, maybe they've got unemployment coming, but they don't know how, what's on the other side of that, or their finances are struggling, or, you know, even our, uh, think about our seniors this year, you know, it's just been a struggle for them. No normal graduation, no normal prom, lots of things in the spring that you normally celebrate not happening. Lots of folks staring at the future, going, what's the future going to hold? Um, just looks empty. You know, what about my career? What about next steps? I get all that. It's a, you know, this is a valley. You know, this is a place that we're in. Uh, but let me just speak to this a moment. I want to say a couple of things about the valley. First of all, the valley can be, and this is in your notes, a confusing place for sure. The valley can be a very confusing place. Like Ezekiel, we might be saying like, what is happening here? Why is this happening to me? Hey, three months ago, this was not happening, and now here I am in this situation I never saw coming. And the good thing is God totally gets that. You know, He, he understands the situation that we're in, and we're experiencing it right now for sure. You know, the seniors, if you're listening, or parents of seniors, you can pass this along to them, but I'm just thinking, you know, whatever step you're about to take, uh, whether you're going to go on to a job after high school or you're going to go to college after high school or go uh, pick up a trade or whatever you're going to do, or if you're graduating from college, about to go on into a career to your next step, whatever um, that, may pl- that may be, I know that the season of life that you're stepping into, you know what, it can be confusing. When you get there, especially when you go to, if you go to college, you know, you're going to hear lots of big ideas about what's right and what's wrong, about how you should believe and what you should think. That's going to come from your friends. That's going to maybe even come from a professor or somebody else. You know, you're going to get lots of things swirling around at times. It's going to be confusing. You may even have doubts and struggles during that time. You know, you're also trying to figure out what am I going to do with my life? What has God got for me? What is my relationships going to look like? Where is my career going to take me? Uh, you know, there, there's just lots of things that are swirling around in there. Among all of the amazing things, by the way, that will happen, it's not all like that, but I just know that it can, there can be moments for you. And my question for you is, what are you going to do in those moments? You know, what are you going to do in that season when you're unsure, when you're looking at your situation going, oh, this is hard, God. What am I supposed to believe right now? And, you know, I think about there's this, this verse or a couple of verses that are really like life verses for me. And I would just say, cling to this right here, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him, and He will make your paths straight. I mean, it's like in those times, in those seasons, we got to get this fixed now in our heart before we ever get into that valley. But I will trust the Lord and lean not on what I think is right, but on what God thinks is right. I'm going to lean into his knowledge and understanding. So let me ask you, where are you going to get that knowledge and understanding? Is it just through reading books or listening to people's opinions? Or, you know, how are you going to get that? Because really, I just want you to know something. There are a lot of good books you can read and lots of good folks who can give you advice. But there's only one source of truth. It is in this book, the Bible, the Word of God. This is the one true source of hope and help for our life. It is our guide You know, it is what God has given us to help us through everything. And in here, God speaks. And he speaks to our circumstances and our situations. And he speaks to the dry bones in our life. And he speaks to us in the valley to give us hope. So I just encourage you, lean into what God is offering through this word and through prayer. And allow him to breathe his spirit of life into you so that you can have knowledge and understanding, and he can make that path straight for you as you go forward. Well, the second thing about the valley is also, it can be a refining place. So the valley can be a place of refining for you and me, and for our faith, and for our life. And I just imagine that this valley that Ezekiel was in, this place was hot, it was dry. Those bones had been laying there for a long time. They were probably bleached out, you know. And so it's just a reminder to the people of Israel, hey, uh, 70 years is a long time. That's a lot of like, you know, planting, you know, vineyards and and marrying people and raising kids and and life. But it's going to be a long season. And during that season, it can be very difficult. But the truth is, God does his best work in the place of the valley, especially in us. You know, sometimes that's the only place where he can really begin to chip off those sinful edges of our life, you know, where where he can 
cause us to learn how to rely on him and to trust him ultimately, you know, to stop listening to all this around us and start focusing on him and, uh, and to truly see him as our source of hope and help and su- sustaining. And so, you know, that's how that valley works. What is that old cliche that says, you know, um, the mountaintop has a beautiful view, but the fruit grows in the valley, right? Uh, another one is Andy Andrews. Um, he's the motivational speaker. He wrote this book called The Noticer. And he said in there, and I thought this was really good, everybody wants to be on the mountaintop. But if you'll remember, mountaintops are rocky and cold. There is no growth on the top of a mountain. Sure, the view is great, but what's a view for? A view just gives us a glimpse of our next destination, of our next target. But to hit that target, we must come off the mountain, go through the valley, and begin to climb the next slope. It is in the valley that we slog through the wet grass and the rich soil, learning and becoming what enables us to summit life's next peak. Uh, isn't that so true? You know, it's down in that valley, you know, where that, where that rich soil is. That's where the good stuff grows in us. That's where we learn. You know, we need to embrace the valley because it's going to help us do a better job of climbing that next mountain, having stronger faith. You see, that's how that works for us. Now think about Psalm 66, 8 through 10 that says this, Praise our God, all peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. For you, God, tested us. You refined us like silver. You know, refining means that we have to melt that metal down and we have to take the impurities out so that we can form it into something new. That's what refining is all about, is making us better. And then you go to James 1, 2 through 4. And James says, hey, consider it pure joy. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And then in verse 12, he says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. What's the point of this? Testing is good. You know, learning perseverance is good. It produces the good thing in us. It makes us stronger. It provides clarity to what we believe, you know. So the thing is, we don't want to, like, wish it away too fast, but we want to embrace the season when it's hard and say, God, what do you want to do in and through me? Because I know that he wants to do something in us. Now, if you're like me, I have a broken place in me that I just want to get the hard thing over with. (laughs) You know, I just want to be done with it. I don't want to have to suffer to see something good happen. I just want God to wave his magic wand, you know, over everything and make everything, you know, roses and palm trees and Krispy Kreme donuts. (laughs) I just want everything like that without having to go through the hard stuff. But that's not how it works. You know, I mean, we were not promised that type of a path, that type of life only. There will be great times, but there will also be these seasons where we have to grow, where we have to become stronger. And so the question is, do we believe that these dry bones can live in our life or not? And do we believe that God has the answer for that? So let's keep going in Ezekiel 37. Back to verse 7. He says, So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these that are slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life, and they stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says, My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up out of them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken. And I love this. And I have done it, declares the Lord. I have done it. You will, when I breathe my life back into you and your life is so different after that, you will know that I have done it. Only God could have done what has happened here. This is a crazy scene, isn't it? It's like something I've I don't know, Indiana Jones or like one of those mummy movies or The Walking Dead, all these bones coming together and 
skin and tissue and muscles and all this coming back on them. They're walking around like a, this army, he says. It's kind of crazy, but you know, it, it's another part of this important scene. It's, it's God saying, listen, I can do this. I will do this. Have hope about that. It reminds me of when God went to Abraham and Sarah, and he spoke to them, and he said, hey, I know you're old, but you're going to have a child. And after he said it, Sarah was like, that's hilarious. That's never going to happen. And God looked at Abraham and went, uh, she just laughed at me. And Abraham was kind of like, I'm sorry, I don't know what to do with her. I can't do anything with her. But anyway, but it was like after that, God says to both of them in Genesis 18, 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? And the answer is no. <laughs> is anything too hard for the Lord in your life or in my life? I mean, if God can speak the universe into existence, right, he can put, bre- he can put life into our faith. I mean, if God can split the sea and cause people to walk through on dry land, if God can raise up a young teenage boy to defeat a giant in Goliath, you know, I think that he can, he can make these bones live, that he can come and restore our faith, that he can put joy and peace and, and all the things that we need back into our life. I mean, really, the question is, do we believe it? Do we believe God will do it? Do we trust him during this season when we're waiting And it seems like it's so long. You know, can we trust God in this time that we're in today? You know, I think about it. He's trying to make us into new people, stronger people of faith. And uh, there was this this pastor, John Stott. He wrote so many books, and he was just a a real influencer in life, somebody who loved the Lord, followed Christ with all of his life. And at the end of his life, another pastor went to be with him, and that pastor reported some of his last words. And basically, he was saying, so, John, how can I pray for you? And, And this was just hours before he passed away. John said this, pray that I will be faithful to Jesus until my last breath. In his last breath, he's laying there on the bed. What else can he do to be faithful to Jesus? But he was like, pray that in my heart and mind I'll be faithful to Jesus because that's how committed he was. And that's my prayer for every single one of us is that we would be faithful to Jesus the whole way while we're on the mountaintop or when we're in the valley and believe that God can do anything in our life and that he wants to do so much through us as individuals and collectively us as a church. He wants to bring our gifts and our passions together to be able to bring life into our community and into this world. So I just want to commend you uh, with that. I want to challenge you with that this week. And just as we continue to plow through these weeks together and uh, that we would just genuinely rely on Jesus for our life. All right, so I'm going to wrap this up here. I just want to do that prayer of blessing, especially for our graduating seniors, because we love you so much, seniors. We believe in you. We know that God has such an important next step for you. And uh, so we just want to um, pray this prayer of blessing over you. Okay, let's pray together. Well, God, we just thank you for um, this morning, and, and we even thank you for the season that we're in, as difficult as it is, that, that you are doing something in all of us right now, and even in our church, that you couldn't do otherwise. And uh, so we believe that you have ordained this time, but, but God, I pray for especially our graduating seniors, those who will graduate high school and college, uh, who are preparing to take an important next step in their life, whatever that step may be. And Lord, we just, we pray that you would put your joy in their heart. I know that so many things have been taken away from them during this season, but God, would you just replace that with confidence about their next step? God, that you would give them hope of what's to come. And Lord, as they go on to whatever that may be, Lord, I pray that the Spirit of Christ would live in them so that when they get to that next place, when they find themselves in a hard time, that they would rely ultimately on you And in the seasons of doubt, they would remember that you were there for them, that they would put all their trust in you and lean not on their own understanding, but they would remember that your word is there to speak life into them during the hard season. So God, we lift them up. We just pray a special prayer of blessing on them because they are going to be a blessing to this world. They are on mission now, and they're going to be on mission wherever they go. And so God, just empower them and inspire them in everything that they do. Help them to know that their church loves them and supports them in every way. And, uh, and so, God, we just pray that you would guide and pray that you would guide all of us, God, during this season right now as we find ourselves in difficult places. Lord, that we would look to you as our hope, as the center point of everything that we are and everything that we have. And, God, that you would give us strength, that you would, that you would put your life in us. And God, we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, folks, thank you again just for being with us this morning. Hey, I just want to say thank you for your giving. It has been consistent, and it has been generous, and you are a blessing to this church. It has enabled us to continue to provide ministry in this community, to do all that we need to do to be a light here. And uh, so really just thank you for that. Um, appreciate that so much. Hey, also, I want you to know that I did a video on Friday. By the way, I have never videoed myself so much in my life. I I have sat in front of a camera so much. But anyway, I did a video on Friday uh, just to give you an idea of how we're going to proceed into the summer. Our executive team met last week and talked about what does it look like to eventually get back into this building uh, for Sunday morning worship, and that is a part of that video. So uh, Jack's going to drop that in the comments if you haven't seen it already. Uh, Please watch that, and please just know that we're praying about these next steps ahead of us and uh, just trying to discern, you know, what is the best way forward for all of us, you and our whole church and this community. So I hope that you'll go and watch that. Um, Also, last thing, Kona Eye Celebration, 3 to 5 p.m. this afternoon. Definitely want to see you there then. Uh, We're going to leave the comments open this morning as we do every week um, uh, so you can uh, just continue the conversation. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to drop in an encouraging word for our graduating seniors. Please show them some love in the comments, and I look forward to us being back together next Sunday on Facebook Live at 9 o'clock. Blessings, and have a great week.